down at Temple Shalom and, and the mosque community and the church community, that that's a start in getting along. You have to know each other. It doesn't matter where the religion started. That isn't it. It's where it is today. I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> It, one of the one of the many organizations that I that I subscribe to by email, I wish I had time to be more involved with them, is an organization based in Montgomery, Alabama, called the Southern uh, Poverty Law Center. Uh, I hope how many of you are familiar with the Southern Poverty Law Center? I'm just curious. Okay, if you're not, please look them up on the internet. It's a marvelous organization. Uh, very educational organization. And, and one of their projects, actually one of their smaller projects, but I think it could make a, a very big difference. Um, and, and it's exactly what you were just saying, Bertha. They get high school, or schools, not just high schools, but schools all over the country to sign up for what they call Mix It Up Day. And the whole premise of it is on Mix It Up Day, when you go to lunch in the cafeteria, instead of sitting with the same people you sit with every day, go sit with somebody else. For one day. Won't kill you. You might even make new friends. And you might find out the people that are always on the other side of the cafeteria from you, that look a little different, maybe speak a little differently. You're really not always. Very briefly, that the Rodney King issue reminded me that, that I'm also one of those who's receiving the 57 blows. In this case, really being subjected to this anti-Muslim sentiment by the popular media. So in many ways, uh, by three of us are also receiving the blows because there's this, the, the darkness of the ignorance of our times that, that the moment you open your mouth and you say religion can be a positive force, people don't want to talk to you. <laughs> Try it next time in a party and say, I teach religion, or I like religion. And you'll see how people just try to run away from you as fast as they can. So many of us feel that we are also victims, just like Rodney King, that we're also tired of really that hearing the same stories that Muslim and Jews hate each other, that they've always been fighting one another. When I hear that coming out of my TV, that but these people have been killing each other for thousands of years, something inside me, really, my heart breaks, because that's not true. We have got along famously for centuries. Right now there's some political problems. There's a different. I make the distinction between political Islam and the religion itself. And also, in regard to really getting to know one another, I totally agree. The media, again, has dehumanized us to such an extent that, that I don't think I have anything in common with a Christian, for example. That I don't have anything in common with a Muslim. And that's not the case. All the way in back, yes, sir. Yeah, I just have uh, two questions. One is, do you think that if a universal language were to be established, it would be a lot easier to get along? And um, you, you said that something about Mix It Up Day. Um, I actually go to EL High School um, back in Auburn. And we have this project, um, and it's called the Unity Project. And we're working on a week where it's just, like, it's just designed to mix it up and to have students you know, be able to talk to one another and not be in the same cliques and in the same groups and stuff. And um, we've recently been, ta been talking about this program called Seeds of Peace, which is kids from all over the world go and they sit down and they get, the, you know, Pakistan, people from Pakistan, people from Haiti, people from all around the world. They sit down and they have these things and they're called um, discussions and they talk about problems that, like these teenagers who are sitting down talking about the world problems. It all comes back to getting to know each other, to recognizing the common humanity of each other. Um, and, and Seeds of Peace, I hope everybody is familiar with it, something that, that we in Maine can be extremely proud of that we hosted here in Maine. Um, your question about, about a common universal language, it tried, of course. Uh, there was, it was about 100 years
years ago, there was the, the, the attempt to create a universal language called Esperanto. It didn't get very far, did it? There are still Esperanto societies around that I think uh, you know, speak to each other in the language, but um, I, don't, I don't think it's, maybe it would help, but I can't help but feeling that it isn't really necessary. Um, I think there's something to gain from our retaining cultural differences and religious differences in terms of what we celebrate and how and why, as long as we don't see them as barriers between us. If we can learn about them and come to appreciate them. Um, now, as, as I said, uh, the three of us uh, spend a lot of our time and, and effort trying to, to spread that kind of idea, subversives that we are. Uh, of, of getting to know people who, who are different. I, I have a, a daughter in her mid-twenties who's now living in Japan. You know, a, a very different culture from, from what she grew up in. And I went to visit her a few months ago there. And, and I, you know, I of course felt completely foreign. And she felt completely at home. Not completely. There's still some differences. But as we learn about each other, um, I find it fascinating, for example, that the religious language of Judaism is Hebrew. The religious language of Islam is Arabic. They are actually very close linguistically. And when I finished my part of the talk and ended with the word shalom and explained its meaning beyond just an absence of conflict, um, I am told that the greeting that's used in Arabic, salam, is exactly the same. The word that Reza talked about for the, the, uh, the pilgrimage to Mecca, the Hajj, is actually a very close linguistic cognate to the Hebrew word Chag, which means festival. And in biblical times, the three chagim, the three festivals commanded in the Bible to the Jewish people, required all Israelite men on each one of those to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to the Holy Temple. So again, even though it's different, as we start getting to know it, it's the same. Marianne, yes. savvy politicians, you, you realize soon that religion, you can use religion to divide communities, to put one community against another. It also mobilizes people. It raises tons of money. I mean, look at the Muslim fundamentalist in, in my own faith. These are very, very dangerous people who have realized that they can mix religion and politics to their own benefit. And as such, uh, these terrorist organizations raise money, they mobilize support, they manage to get young persons from misguided, brainwashed, uh, to go and kill themselves and kill other innocents, and yet say, I'm doing it for Islam. A religion which clearly states, if you kill one person, you've killed the humanity. If you save one person, you've saved the humanity. This is a holy verse in our holy book, Quran, in Arabic, very clear, no ambiguity about that. And yet you would see and hear of, of Muslims who go around killing other innocents and in the process hurting themselves. Another crime in Islam, that you cannot hurt yourself and hurt others in the name of religion. That's where the politics get involved. You're absolutely right. Politics can be used to divide communities. And, and so, so often in history, when we look at 
conflicts that have been have been phrased as religious conflicts, we realize they really aren't. Um, you know, the conflict in Northern Ireland between Protestants and Catholics, that was never about which was the better way to follow Jesus. It was about power. It's just that because of economics primarily and political history, those two groups broke down along those religious lines. But it wasn't about the religion. The conflict in the Middle East is not about a conflict between Judaism and Islam. It's about power. It's about control of land. It's about control of resources like water. It's not about the religions. Just to add my voice to that, that it seems to me all too often we've used the religious terminology as the excuse for covering up uh, the kind of political and powerful uh, disagreements that we've had. And I think all of our faiths would teach that there are certain limits to how we can disagree with each other and how we express that and how we try to resolve it. And I don't think any of them would uh, support the idea of trying to persuade other people uh, at the point of a gun. To use that kind of physical violence. Uh, better that we learn about each other, that we find ways to pray with each other and pray for each other and not try to twist everybody's arm. I think it's important to be uh, recognize our shared humanity, our interconnectedness on this ever more uh, finite planet that you touched on about resources and so forth. And maybe okay to have a religious tagline, which I do. Mm -hmm. I'm half Christian and half Jewish, and I'm curious about uh, Islam and, and all other faiths. And, and I value uh, religion in, in my life. But if my religion or any religion is to say something that is anti-human and anti-good and is going to cause harm, I'm going to run in the other direction, especially if they don't even have a sense of humor either. That's very important. Amen to that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yes, sir. Hi, yes, um, just some, a couple observations and a question. Um, but first, I'm going to remark on um, how grateful uh, I am for being able to be here as part of this uh, discussion. Um, really learned a lot uh, from all of you really found some things interesting, especially about the some of the stats of Islam um, and the Muslim population. I found that pretty intriguing. Um, so some observations. One thing I noticed um, is there, there's a recognition uh, throughout this whole room that there's a conflict exists, uh, that there is um, there, there's disarray in society, there's disorder. Um, and, and and we're here exploring that right now. And, um, and, and then Another observation is what I see is, is what the common ground that came out from your discussion is this 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 uh, need to to think about others to to be empathetic to be compassionate uh, the golden rule prefer one's brother before thyself um, and that's some, that's that's something you all express and, and share and I'm wondering and my question is um, this seems like to be a beginning step to explore that further how that can collaboration. Uh, occur, and I'm wondering if there, there are future thoughts about how that collaboration may evolve and become uh, uh, involve more people from the various or various communities. Um, knowing that in order to tackle these conflicts that exist in society, it requires a unified effort. Couldn't agree more. Uh, I would love to see and be part of a community organization here in the Lewiston Auburn area that brings people in from different faith traditions, from no faith tradition, from just with uh, the goal of getting to know each other better and doing some good work in the community in the meantime. I'm not aware of any specific existing organization. There are many uh, very good organizations based in different faith communities in the LA area. Uh, I'm part of one that's for clergy, uh, and Brother Matthias is part of that as well. Um, although it, it doesn't 
it isn't all inclusive. We wish that, that we could reach out to subgroups that, that haven't joined with us. Um, there, having said that, there are a number of national and international organizations uh, that we could set up a local branch of. I've been looking at some online. And, uh, and decide where we want to go with it and what we want to do with it. And just as a show of hands, no commitment. I'm not taking down your name and license number. Uh, but if we were to put out the word of such an organization having an organizational meeting to talk about what to do with it, how many of you would come? You got it. So isn't there, um, Hillel, isn't Welcoming Maine such an organization? I, I suppose it is, but I, I, you know, they don't even have a website, the last I checked. And I, speaking of, you know, modern faux pas, they don't even have a website. Um, it, maybe, well, maybe that's the group, and, and if I can get in touch with them, if you have a way of, of contacting I, them. Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, sir, you, know, you just asked that question. When we break up here, would you come find me, and let's exchange contact information, and let's work together and see if we can get something done, and we'll put the word out. Any other? Leo. Could you just mention your wonderful concept? I believe you called it um, religious envy. Or I may not have gotten the term right. Yes. Uh, a number of years ago, there was a dean of the Harvard Divinity School, named Christer Stendhal, uh, who had been the Lutheran bishop of Stockholm, Sweden, which is where he was from originally. And uh, in, in the midst of a, a somewhat rancorous uh, interfaith discussion that went on in Stockholm while he was the bishop there, he kind of called a timeout and he said, you know, folks, let's, let's stop a minute and think about what's going on here. And he came up with what I've come to call Stendhal's three rules of interfaith understanding. Number one, if you want to know something about a faith that is not yours, that you're not familiar with, ask a follower, not an enemy of it. Duh. <laughs> Number two, don't compare your best with their worst, which faith traditions have done all through history. And number three, and I love this one, and this is the one that Leo was just asking about. Spandau said, save room for holy envy. Now what does that mean? What I've taken it to mean is when you look at a religion and a faith tradition not your own, you may see things that could never work for you for theological reasons or other reasons, but that you can see how well it works for the religion that uses it. That you can be even a little envious that they have that path that you don't. And maybe you can find a way to adapt it. And, and I'll just give you a quick example, which I think helps to understand this. Um, as a rabbi, as a Jew, I have attended occasional church services. Uh, and there was a, a time that I was in a, uh, a Roman Catholic church here in the Lewiston Auburn area. Um, St. Joseph's when it was still open. And the priest at the time uh, was and remains a, a good friend. Uh, he's now in Portland area. And, and he had invited me to come. It was a special occasion. And as the, the uh, Roman Catholics who were there attending the Mass went up to the rail to receive communion, which I, of course, did not, uh, and I'm watching this and I'm thinking about, you know, this could never work for Jews. The idea uh, in Roman Catholicism that, that the priest, through saying certain words, is able to literally change the wafer and the wine into the blood and the body of the Christ. This could never work for Jews. But I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, wow, I can really appreciate how that works for Catholics. You want to get close to God? Take God inside of you. Wow. Can't work for me, but boy do I respect that. As part of, 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 of Catholicism. That's an example. Um, and, and once I came to that realization, whenever I look at other religions now, I try to find something, whether or not it could work for, for Judaism, that I can appreciate. I used, I used a, a statement uh, from the Quran when I was giving my, 
my few minutes about Judaism. I also frequently use uh, a passage from the Gospels. That when someone came to Jesus and asked, what are the most important commandments? And he said, love God and love your neighbor. Of course, where did he learn that? Good Jewish boy that he was. Um, you know, this is, this is what it's about. This is more of a comment um, than anything, but the church that I have been affiliated with previous to right now, um, one of the things, and I was a religious education director there, one of the things that we always, was always part of the curriculum, continues to be always part of the curriculum, is world religions. And we would teach the children about Islam and about Judaism and many of the world faiths. And um, I think that that was in part responsible for the fact that I, um, several years ago, attended what is called the Chaplaincy Institute of Maine, which is a small school in Portland, but it is to become an interfaith chaplain. And there is a lot of this going on around the country. And I think that it is all for the good. And I, I, when, when we were doing units on Islam, I just, I would say to people, some of those holidays and the beliefs, you know, they're beautiful. And I, I would get some like, oh really? Looks. And, um, and many, we're all trying to get to the same place through our own lenses. And um, some, someone said to me, it's, it's, uh, it's like looking at God through a window with differently colored panes of glass. And you see through the yellow pane, and I see through the red one, and you see through the blue one, and we're all looking the same direction at the same thing, but they're colored differently. And I, and I just love that. Yes, sir. Um, in the Baha'i faith, uh, the prophet Baha'u'llah said, he, he made this analogy and he says, imagine there's a rose garden and you walk past that rose garden every day and it's the same color, like it's just red. You know, eventually it kind of gets born. Now, if you take some reds and some oranges and some yellows and you throw that all into the garden, it becomes lively and stuff, and it's the same thing with religion. If you only have one religion, then you know, I mean, we would all agree on a lot of things, but there would be nothing new to explore. Like, you know, and oh, I agree with you completely. I, I, I'm absolutely convinced that if we were all the same religion, God would be bored. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, couple of things. Meaning like this is very good. Yeah. Uh, we get to know each other. Things that ideas that we may have had in the head but come and find out <laughs> it's not true. Uh, the second thing about a universal language, to me, learning another language, you learn about the, those people. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and brings you closer together. And the third thing is, the problem, one of the problems I see is the American news well, if it bleeds, it leads. So get me started. Okay? And that's it. I, I watch uh, NBC News. You know, for the first 25 minutes, if it bleeds, it leads. And then the last two minutes, I'll have some little short story about somebody who did something good. Yep. And it should probably be the reverse. But. Yeah, I, it, 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 one of my little hobby horses, and thank you for leading me to it, Aaron. Uh, is, is if only if all you know about the world is what you see on, the, on TV news, you don't know the world. Um, and, and we live in an age today when we have more opportunity to learn from more sources than human beings ever have in our history. And it'll only get more. That doesn't mean that everything we see on the internet is true. Far from it. Uh, no more than, as, as somebody once said to me, you know, well, if it's in the supermarket tabloids, it must be true, right? Uh, no. Um, so, you know, you have to take it with a grain of salt. But, if you, but you can, you know, it, it, 
there was a time when, when you could read, you know, three, four, five newspapers a day. Okay, fine. Now you can read dozens, if you want to, from different points of view, from different countries, even all in English. Uh, that, I mean, just as an example, uh, you know, if you want to know more about Israel from an Israeli point of view, there are two daily newspapers in Israel that publish on the internet in English, and they are very different political viewpoints. Now, this is one example. Um, so, yeah, it's it's important to realize that and to look farther and farther afield to get information. This is the famous subject we always talk about, because when we go out and talk to communities, and at times we mention all the positive and, and good news, how Christians and Muslims and Jews and others are reaching out to one another, they're working together really well, even in Israel. There are a number of organizations where Palestinians and Israelis are working together to resolve some of their own issues, to address some of the concerns, the number of organizations, the fact that the Saudi king for the first time invited a group of rabbis to go and talk about ways to resolve the conflict and help the Saudi government to start the process to recognize Israel. I mean, that's amazing. We didn't hear about it here. The mainstream media never reported. And I think that's the kind of news we all need to hear. How in Chicago, Jewish high school and Muslim high school students and Christians are going around building houses for the homeless. Abu Patel, who is this amazing young Muslim scholar from India, originally from India, uh, is, has started this organization. He brings all these communities together and, and helps young persons to get to learn one another. One of our dreams has been to invite him to come to Maine to speak to young persons here. The point is, somehow, the mainstream media would not report anything like that. Because if a dog bites a man, it's news. But if, uh, if it's not news. But if a man, if a, if a man bites a dog, it's the news. Yes. So to give an example, when Rabbi and I started to teach at LEC, the first time we did this course, and we had a number of young persons, 18 year olds or not, coming from sheltered communities, coming to us and telling us how much they liked this course. For them to see a rabbi and a Muslim just walking together, hugging and talking to one another, being respectful to each other, this, this is big for them. And uh, so I thought, I came up with this brilliant idea that I would call my reporter, friend of mine, and say, why can't you do a story of this? So I called Portland Press Herald, I'm based in Portland, and uh, kept calling them and saying, this, this amazing thing is going on, that there's this course about Muslims, and, and, and back then it was only about Muslims, and, and Jewish uh, interactions, and they weren't interested. The reports were telling me, so what? You're teaching this course and the students are enjoying it. So at one point during the conversation with one particular reporter, I, I thought I would say something to get this person's attention, because I could hear that the, 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 the reporter was getting bored, so I said, listen, now if I were to, God forbid, if I were to slap this rabbi, this would be news, front page, a Muslim slaps a rabbi. <laughs> and of course you would cover it and it would, you would not drop the story. Why can't you write something if you're getting along? If you love one another? And he, he laughed and he said, I'll be there next week. And we got this gorgeous column. Just to share with you that really we, we need to, to encourage the media to report on positive and good news as well as the bad. On the other hand, I seem to recall that we also did a, an interview with a TV, no, we didn't clap each other, um, or at least they missed that one. Um, but we also, we also did a, a, TV, yes. a TV interview that, as far as I know, never got shown. That's right. Something else must have come up. Jeff. Uh, I just want to say that, uh, and, and you touched on it in the discussion today, that uh, you know, the conflicts for resources often get painted as, uh, as religious conflicts. And that's actually, these conflicts over resources are only going to become 
more and more intense over water, oil, precious metals, whatever, stuff like that. And that's why gatherings like this, I think, are so valuable because, uh, you know, it begins to break down that facade that, uh, you know, it's religion yep. and, uh, you know, how religions are being hijacked by, by the politicians. And I think you all three have done a great job of, of really emphasizing that. Thank you. One more, and then I'm going to call time. But if anybody wants to stay and chat afterward, that's fine. Yes, ma'am. You had your hand up? Oh, okay. Joy. I have a question. I don't know if this is the right core question. Why do people convert? This is something I don't understand. Why do people convert from one religion to another? I don't think so. I, I, I think that it's always a personal thing. Oh, it is? Uh, Well, in, in modern in modern religion, we tend to want to make it a little more formal than that. I feel it's but actually, bi biblically, that's the way it was. Did you want to have something? Else? No. Okay. Um, I I want to finish um, with a with another version of Pat's metaphor about looking through different colored panes of glasses at God. There is a mountain, and around the bottom of the mountain. There are villages. But the villages are so placed around this big mountain that they can't see each other. They don't know that the other exists. And from each village there is a path that climbs the mountain from each village. And a few people from each village go on that path. And at first, of course, they still can't see each other. But as they get higher and higher towards the peak, they begin to see each other. They begin to see the trails converging. And of course, eventually, the trails all reach the peak. They've come from different places looking for the same thing. At first, we can't see each other. But if we make a little bit of an effort, we are not only seeing each other, but we're helping each other up our respective trails and reaching the common goal. I thank my colleagues Reza Jalali and Brother Matthias Tanner for participating in this. I thank you all for coming and participating and being a part of something that is so important I can't even express how important I feel that it is. And as we said uh, a few minutes ago, we'll see if we can get something going here in the LA community that will keep this conversation going. It would be a shame to let it die. But in the spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., let's live for a future where we're all working towards that beloved community that he talked about so much. Thank you all. Shalom. Salam.